today I'm going to be talking about some recent research in this preprint that you can check out here of cradle complexity and cradle transitions in unitary circuit dynamics. So fundamentally, what we're trying to do is identify signatures of chaos and really extend notions of chaos that have been well studied in static systems, say Hamiltonian dynamics, to driven systems, or more generally, any system where you don't where you no longer have this notion of a local Hamiltonian. Then hopefully with some applications in quantum computing and numerical algorithms. So all of this work was done in together with Philippe Suxland, one of my PhD students here in Dresden at PKS, who's also currently doing an internship with Google Quantum AI, and Roderick Mercer, who I'm sure all of you have gotten the opportunity to admire in the past few weeks. So a short overview of what I'm going to be talking about. First, since I'm not going to assume that anyone is familiar with curl complexity, I'm going to be giving a short introduction to what's known there in static models, so in case where we just have some local Hamiltonian. Then I'm going to be moving on to our research, which is namely extending this notion of curl of complexity to unitary dynamics. Think, for example, Floquet dynamics. And I'm going to be specifically focusing on unitary circuits, which are a very natural platform where you can uh, implement Floquet dynamics using quantum computing uh, tools. After that, I'm going to be making some connections with more traditional probes of quantum chaos, namely the spectral function, before moving on to conclusions. So, first of all, what is curl complexity? Well, let me first motivate where this is coming from. So, we're really fundamentally interested in looking into the dynamics of many body systems. And typically, we look at the dynamics by looking at observables. So, we can look at the dynamics of any specific observable O, which is undergoing some unitary transformation generated by this Hamiltonian age. Typically, it's going to be a horribly complicated object. So if we want to get some insight into what's happening, we can do a Taylor expansion for short times. And then we see that we get this nice series appearing, where, of course, we start from our original operator. Then we have the commutator for the Hamiltonian. And we have higher order nested commutators appearing. And the basic idea is that we start from some very, something very simple. And then these higher order nested commutators encode all of the non-trivial dynamics. And one way of seeing this is, for example, if you have a one-dimensional lattice, we have a Hamiltonian, which just contains some nearest neighbor interactions. If I start from a single one-side operator, then the commutator is going to consist of two-side operators. This second-order nested commutator is going to consist of three-side operators. So you can tell that as higher and higher order terms become important, as you go to later times, or initially local operator, it's going to have spread out, which is also, of course, known as scrambling. Another way of seeing that is that I have an initial operator O, say I have this one-dimensional lattice here. If I look at the commutator with Hamiltonian, this is going to be a sum of two side operators, in total acting on three sides, second order nested commutator with five sides, and so on. So if we know these nested commutators, first we know the full dynamics. And as such, they encode the operator growth, the operator dynamics. Then the issue is that just knowing the first few commutators doesn't really tell us anything. Because it might be that as we go to higher order nested commutators, we keep generating, for example, new terms, or we get terms that are already contained in the first operator. So we can basically recover one side operator by just keeping the operators commuting. So one thing that was proposed in this very nice paper by Daniel Parker, which really uh, sparked his entire field, is that instead of looking at these commutators, we basically construct some orthonormal basis, which is known as a Krilov basis, from these operators. So I take my initial operator O, I take the Liouvillian, or rather the commutator with the Hamiltonian acting on this. I'm just introducing this notation to avoid having to write too many commutators. And I do some orthonormalization. And for example, I can represent my operators as states. I can define the overlap, which is necessary to define orthonormality uh, from the trace norm. And if I do a graduate orthonormalization on these operators, I end up with some orthonormal operator basis. So Clearly, my first operator is just my original observable. This second operator, O1, is going to be some linear combination of my operator and its commutator with the Hamiltonian, and so on. And the nice thing is that if we do this, actually, we can show that the Liouvillian reduces to a very simple, very nice form, which is very easy to interpret. Namely, acting with the Liouvillian, so the commutator with the Hamiltonian, on any of these orthonormal operators, simply produced, return some linear combination of, say, the next basis operator and the previous one. So we have this tridiagonal form. This is really something that's quite, uh, that basically arises everywhere within these Krilov or Langshaw's methods. And basically, once we know these Langshaw's coefficients, B1, B2, B3, we really just encode the action of the commutator with the Hamiltonian on this operator basis, which can fully describe the dynamics. 
then we fully know the problem. Then we fully solve this. And this basically means that we need to do this organization. But once this is done, the dynamics becomes very simple. It has a direct interpretation as a one-dimensional hopping problem, but now not in my original one-dimensional lattice, but rather I can identify every one of my orthonormal Krilov basis operators with a lattice site. For example, O0 is first lattice site, O1 second, O2 third, and so on. At time zero, I simply have my original observable, which by definition is simply this lattice site. And then as time goes on, the dynamics are going to be governed by these Langshans coefficients in the form of a simple hopping problem. So my observable can hop either to the right or to the left with some hopping amplitude, which is set by these Langshans coefficients, which I get by doing this orthonormalization. So what we see is that if you have some initially localized operator, just going to be localized in space, then it's going to spread out within this curve space, which then encodes how it spreads out in real space. If we know these Langshans coefficients, we can fully characterize this spreading out. And now the reason people are interested in this, because it might seem quite formal so far, that if you look into these Langshans coefficients, they seem to exhibit some universal behavior, which is directly related to how chaotic the underlying Hamiltonian is. And in this way, you can also relate this to quite a lot of more familiar probes of quantum chaos, which I'm not really going to go into. But basically, in this paper, they calculated these Langshans coefficients bn, so again, just doing this optimization, and see how they change for higher order. So basically, as you move along the lattice, how these helping amplitudes change. And they recognize three qualitatively different behaviors. Namely, if I look at the chaotic model, so this top blue line here, they do this for the SYK model. I can see that my Langshans coefficients grow linearly. So as I go further along my lattice, my hopping strength increases. You can actually show using some fundamental bounds that this linear growth is the maximum you can get. You can also look at free models, say, think of the transit field Ising model, so models that can be mapped to free fermions. If you calculate these coefficients there, they just stay constant. So they don't change as you go along the lattice. Then if you look at some interacting integral model, which is different from a non-interacting integral model, for example, this XXX Heisenberg model, then you can see that you have growth that's faster than constant, slower than linear, and in fact here it simply seems to grow as the square root of n. So there's this very different scalings, which seem to be related to how chaotic your underlying dynamics is. And because we have these different coefficients, we're going to have different dynamics, since I mentioned these fully encode all the dynamics. And this has led to this notion of Krilov complexity. Namely, as your operator spreads out in Krilov space, you can say that its complexity increases. So I take my time of operator, I expand this in my Krilov basis of my orthonormalized operators, and I get some expansion coefficients. So I can really just think of this as some particle spreading out over this chain. And then, what people did is simply say, okay, my first Krilov operator has complexity zero, second one has complexity one, uh, sorry, two, third one complexity two, and so on. So the Krilov complexity is basically just the average position of your particle, of your observable, in this Krilov lattice. And again, this seems somewhat artificial, but you can show that this presents a fundamental bound for different measures of complexity. So in that sense, I do believe this is a reasonable thing to look at. Um, and can also, for example, use this to balance operator spreading and OTOX, for example. So the intuitive picture here is that you have this one-dimensional lattice, and you have your helping amplitudes, B1, B2, B3, and so on. The interesting thing is that you can easily show that if these grow linearly, as you would expect in a chaotic system, following these previous results on the so-called universal oper operator growth hypothesis, so basically what I've shown you here, if these grow linearly, then you're going to get an exponential growth and complexity, which is, of course, what you expect for chaotic dynamics. Whereas if you don't have this linear growth in your coefficients, you're going to have slower complexity growth, which in turn also presents bounds again on OTOX. So people have studied this quite a lot in the past years for a specific case of Hamiltonian dynamics. And everything is really based on knowing this action of the Liouvillian, so the combination of the Hamiltonian. And there's been lots of really interesting connections to different aspects of quantum chaos. But of course, all of this is underlined by the fact that you have this static Hamiltonian. So what we try to do is to extend this entire notion to unitary dynamics, where you no longer have the notion of some static Hamiltonian. And I should say, we're not the first to do that. So there's been this very nice paper by Aditya Mitra and Daniel Yates, who have done this for a Floquet Hamiltonian. You basically just take your Floquet Hamiltonian and apply the previous framework. But I'm interested in a very different setup. Namely, we're going to be considering a unitary circuit. 
Now, for those of you who are not familiar with unitary circuits, it's a concept that originated from quantum computation. And the idea is that instead of having some horribly complex unitary evolution operator, which is generated by some local Hamiltonian, you construct a unitary evolution operator for your full system using local building blocks, which are unitary gates. So you can just think of this as unitary evolution for two, gate, two sides. And from that, you construct a unitary evolution operator for your full lattice. And graphically, you represent the unitary gates in this way, so simply as the square. And then by arranging these in this periodic pattern, you can de design a unitary evolution operator for your full lattice. And now your lattice is discrete, but also because you've introduced some discrete time step, your time is also now discrete. So in that sense, if all of these gates are identical, you recover some Floquet system. So we're going to be looking at basically how can we quantify the dynamics, whether it is scaltic or integrable, of these models. And I should say, people have already studied quite a lot, and we also know that these unitary gates, they can be chaotic. Some of them can be mapped to free fermions. Some of them can be solved by beta ansatz, and they're in that sense inter interacting integrable models. But there's still quite a lot of interesting research to be done. So one of the reasons that we're interested in applying uh, this Krilov uh, approach to these models is that they satisfy a very similar notion of locality as what we saw in Hamiltonian dynamics. So I'm going to again use some graphical language. So say I have some initial operator O, which just acts on a single side. And so every line in here simply represents one side of my lattice. This circle here represents my operator O acting on a random side. Everywhere else, it just acts trivially. If I take a single time step, so I do a single time, a single unitary transformation with a full layer of my lattice, then I get something looking like this, where this square, square here is a unitary gate. This red square is a submission conjugate. But crucially, most of the gates are just going to vanish. And if I do this unitary transformation for a single discrete time step, I'm going to put an operator x on two sides. I can keep doing this. Most of my gates are going to vanish. After two discrete time steps, I end up with an operator that acts on four sides. After three discrete time steps, I end up with an operator that acts on six sides. So there's this notion of a causal light cone. It also very clearly shows that the support of the operator grows linearly with the number of discrete time steps. Same as what we saw for this Liouvillian, for this commutator of the Hamiltonian, that as you have this repeated action, you end up with more and more non-local ob objects. So the question is then, OK, can we identify some notion of complexity in here? which relates naturally to what we saw in Hamiltonian dynamics. Now, we can do a very basic thing, a very naive thing. So I've just shown you, we look at the unitary transformation. I can define some operator, some super operator, which acting on an observable simply does this unitary transformation. And I can do the same orthonormalization procedure. And if I do that, I end up with then some one-dimensional lattice problem. So now it's slightly more complicated than what we expect for Hamiltonian dynamics, but it's still very much doable. Actually, it's much more doable than we were initially expecting. So you again have a model with hopping to the right and to the left. Um, what we see is that rather than having one series of numbers, so these B coefficients encoding the right and left hopping, we no longer have a Hermitian model. So we need three sets of amplitudes rather than just a single one, which is still much less than you would expect in the general problem. And we, look, we obtain some one-dimensional dynamics with this at asymmetric hopping. So we start from initially localized observable. It again evolves in curve space. We can take one step to the right with some amplitude B1, which is really just the equivalent of these amplitudes that I've just discussed for Hamiltonian dynamics. Or it can hop backwards. And now we have long-range backwards hopping. But as I'm going to show you later, you can actually mostly neglect this because this is going to fall off exponentially. And there's also some on-site interaction. And basically, if we characterize the hopping to the right, the hopping to the left, and this on-site interaction, we fully understand the dynamics. Now, we can just do this. We have some formal expression for unitary evolution operator. But if we want to make a connection with Hamiltonian dynamics, we can specify our problem. And then we restrict ourselves to so-called trotterized dynamics. And trotterized dynamics is unitary circuit dynamics. That arises quite naturally in many numerical algorithms and also analytically. If we start from some local Hamiltonian dynamics, and we decompose the full time evolution in a series of smaller time steps. So I take some small time step delta t. I can just write my full evolution in this way. And then by doing a series of conventional approximations, you can actually write the evolution with this local Hamiltonian as a unitary circuit, where essentially if you have this Hamiltonian, which is a sum of two-side local terms, 
You can simply construct a unitary gate from every two-side Hamiltonian with small delta t. And the unitary circuit that is constructed from these gates is going to be to very good approximation, as in two order delta t squared, equivalent to the Hamiltonian dynamics. Physically, of course, we've moved to Hamiltonian dynamics, where you have conservation of energy, to Floquet dynamics. So in that sense, it's interesting to check how having non-zero time step here basically shows up in the Krilov framework. And why this is interesting, again, why we can make the connection with Hamiltonian dynamics, if you look at the unitary transformation of some observable, if you have this small time step, you basically can just do a Taylor expansion in delta t, you recover your original observable, and then you basically again get the commit of the Hamiltonian. So our unitary transformation, our unitary super operator, is the identity times this Liouville up until some corrections. So we should expect that if we see some universal behavior in the Krilov dynamics in the Hamiltonian case, then we might also see some signs of universal behavior in this unitary Krilov dynamics. And fortunately, we do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. And we can make some connections to what people have already observed and then also relate this to different probes of quantum chaos. So in this figure, we basically look at a series of trotterized skeletal Hamiltonians just chosen randomly from the GUE. And if we do this, I can look at how these Langstroth coefficients behave as I increase my index n. And also I do this for different trotter steps, and we find that we get some nice collapse if we plot everything as a function of n times delta t to some power g, which we don't expect to be universal. That's a convenient way of representing this data. So the orange line here, is hopping to the left. The green line is hopping to the right. The blue line is the on-site energy. And we can identify three distinct, or rather two distinct regimes with some intermediate crossover. Namely for small n, and hence also small delta t, small time steps, we recover something that's very close to what we saw in the Hamiltonian case. Namely, the hopping amplitudes seem to grow linearly. And the diagonal element basically, it's close to identity, it's close to one, just decreases. What we see then at large n, then clearly the unitary dynamics is fundamentally different from what we see in the Hamiltonian case. And this has a very nice interpretation, which I'm going to get to in the next slide. But what we see is that almost all the hopping amplitudes and on-site energies goes to zero. Everything is really just dominated by this hopping to the right. So in this regime, we essentially have unidirectional hopping. An interpretation here is that for these sufficiently large Krilov operators, the dynamics is essentially maximally scrambling. So you have operators are so complex that any unitary transformation basically returns um, a different observable, a different operator, which is completely orthonormal to all of the previous ones, which is in a sense maximally ergodic. So what I've just told you, if you have only unidirectional hopping, if I act with my unitary transformation on some observable, I'm oh, sorry, on some curl of operator, I get a new one. These are orthonormal, which is telling me that if I look at the correlation function, which directly falls from the overlap between these curl of operators, I actually find that the autocorrelation function, so basically I take my operator O, I do the unitary evolution for t discrete time steps, I multiply with my observable O again, and I take the trace. You can think of this as some infinite temperature correlation function. I can rewrite this in this language of operators and superoperators, and this simply gives me a delta function. So these operators basically are completely memoryless, they are maximally ergodic. So in that sense, the correlation vanishes immediately, and we can also treat them effectively as a memoryless bot for the operator dynamics. Again, this might be a bit abstract, but if you think back to this hopping picture, what we see is that if we look at this hopping amplitudes, for the beginning of the lattice, so small uh, index of lattice sites, we have hopping to the right. We need to calculate this. We have hopping back to the left. You have some on-site interactions, and those we need to know. Then if I look further away in this lattice, so at more complicated objects, the, the hopping becomes unidirectional. Essentially, every uh, part of your wave function, every part of your observable that enters this part of the regime just keeps hopping to the right and is never going to return, which means it's never going to be accessible through local measurements. So all these observables here, once your wave function has spread to them, you can essentially just throw them out, and they're not going to impact any of the dynamics anymore. This is, of course, a different way of looking at scrambling. This also tells you that if you want to design numerical algorithms, to study many body dynamics, we really only need to conserve ourselves with this first part of the curve space. And then everything else we can essentially just throw out because the moment your initial operator has leaked into this part of your operator Hilbert space, 
it's never going to become accessible again by doing local measurements. So it's not going to be relevant for, say, correlation functions. And of course, it's something that people have also realized in recent years. For example, if you look at this dissipated assistor pip, the operator evolution, you can essentially just kill part of your Hilbert space to allow for more efficient numerical simulation of your dynamics. Now, this was just some numerics. You can actually also get some analytic results. And I'm not really going to go into this in a lot of detail, but we can choose specific unitary circuits which have the property that they are so-called dual unitary, which means that the dynamics that they generate is unitary in both time and space. The nice thing about these models is that you can show two things. Namely, they are maximally chaotic, so you can have maximally ergodic dynamics in these systems, which is perhaps not that surprising. But the other property is that you can actually exactly calculate autocorrelation functions in these models. You can design them in whatever way you want to. So I could, for example, take some unitary circuits. I can choose some observable O. So that the autocorrelation fun function simply decays exponentially with some power T of some number lambda, which is smaller than one. So at long times, this autocorrelation function is simply going to exponentially decay to zero. This is basically the only ingredient I need to do this Krilov dynamics. I can write down my unitary super operator. I find that I simply need to consider the hopping between the first two terms. So this is between O1 and O2. Everything else simply goes back to this unidirectional hopping. So I have this maximally ergodic dynamics there. I can calculate my Krilov complexity. And now we find that instead of growing exponentially, this grows linearly, which is the maximal possible growth you can have in unitary circuits, after some initial transient time, which is simply set by this parameter lambda. So I just want to show you to show you that we can also do some analytics here. And I've shown you this now for chaotic models, where you really recover this profile almost everywhere. So we see, again, this universal behavior, which represents the linear growth that we see in Hamiltonian dynamics, and then some new regime, which is basically where the fact that you have unitary dynamics sets in. But if I do this for unitary circuits, they can be mapped to non-tracking fermions. So for example, here, I simply choose the trot decomposition of the XXYY chain. I find something completely different. So here, I show these Langshaw's coefficients as a Xn for again hopping to the left, hopping to the right on site interactions. Growth complexity is going to exhibit submaximal growth. So, in that sense, this the unitary dynamics in these three models is again qualitatively different from what we see in the chaotic case. But the interesting thing is that this kind of figure is what we get for sufficiently small trotter steps. Actually, the moment we start increasing the trotter steps, so increase the discrete time step delta t. We can recover some dynamics that's, again, qualitatively similar to what we see in the Celtic case. So this probe of quantum chaos actually also allows us to distinguish different regimes depending on how close to the Hamiltonian case you are, as quantified by the Strother step delta t. Now, in order to understand that, let me basically plot this large n limit of these tridiagonal elements. So basically the value that these converge to for sufficiently large n. And if I do that, I get a figure that looks quite a lot to what I've already shown you happens in Celtic dynamics. So I have the hopping to the right, which is the green line, hopping to the left, orange, onsite interaction, blue. It's a pretty small trotter step. These all converge to values which are close to either zero or one. As I keep increasing the trotter step, they vary smoothly. And then at some value of delta t, they can change non-analytically to either one, and then stay constant, or zero. And basically, in this second regime, this is exactly what we observe in the Celtic case, where we have observables that are maximally ergodic, their correlation function vanish, and basically, once your initial operator has spread to that part of your operator Hilbert space, it has become inaccessible, which is quite interesting. So we have this critical uh, trotter step, which here equals pi over 8, for reasons that I will get into later. And as your trot if your trotter step is close enough, you still get something that's qualitatively different from chaotic dynamics. You get something that resembles the Hamiltonian dynamics. But then the moment your trotter step becomes too large enough, you can actually get dynamics in your interior circuit that again resembles your chaotic dynamics, despite the fact it's no longer uh, that despite the fact it's actually highly non-ergodic. Um, okay, we can also do this for interacting integrable systems. I don't want to go into this too much, but we did this for the trotter decomposition of the XXZ Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Let me again recover these distinct regimes. But the one crucial observation here is that this is much, much noisier than what we saw in the Celtic case. Just almost counterintuitive, but it's something that we can explain. And it's actually also something that people have shown 
in these sets of very nice papers by Anatoly Marsky and co-authors, and also here by uh, Julian Sauner and some co-authors, that if we look into the curl of coefficients, they're much noisier. We think back to our interpretation of curl of dynamics. So if we look into, if we think back to these amplitudes as hopping strengths, the fact that these are much noisier means we have, we're going to have a disordered hopping problem, which is going to lead to localization, which is going to lead to a slower growth of complexity growth. Now, that takes me to the final part of my talk. So most of what I've just shown you so far are essentially numerical observations. We can actually fully understand everything I've just told you by going back to a different uh, quantifier of quantum chaos, maybe a spectral function, which is encoding a response of a system. Now, just to be as explicit as possible. So in a curl of dynamics, we probe the spectral function, which is defined in this way. So I have the eigenstates P of my inter-evolution operator U. So you can think of this, for example, as your forecast states. It's unitary, so I have some eigenphases, e to the i theta p. I can define the spectral function f naught of omega squared as the sum over matrix elements of my observable between eigenstates of my unitary evolution. And then I have a delta function, which basically fixing the frequency to be equal to the phase difference between my uh, two eigenstates. So this is basically the object that appears extremely naturally in linear response telling you how your system is going to respond to an external perturbation at some frequency omega. You can also think of this as a Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function of your observable. And essentially, any non-trivial frequency dependence of your spectral function is a sign that you have non-trivial dynamics. Because this is essentially also the object that distinguishes eigenstate normalization hypothesis, which is how we currently understand the dynamics in Celtic systems, from random matrix theory, which was perhaps the most naive way of thinking about ETH. And specifically what I mean by that, if I look at ETH, it makes a prediction for the off-diagonal matrix element of an observable in the eigenbasis of my unitary evolution operator. And here, because I no longer have conservation of energy, this looks something like this. So I have this 1 over square root D, where D is the dimension of my local Hubbard space. So off-diagonal matrix elements are exponentially small. I have some variable RPQ, which is just some Gaussian random variable with zero variance and unit mean. And then ETH tells me that I have some non-trivial enveloping function here, which depends on this frequency. Now, this is different from random matrix theory, where if I would assume that either my observable or my unitary evolution operator is a random matrix, I would expect that these matrix elements are basically simply random variables R with this 1 over square root D. So really the fact that we have this non-trivial spectral function does that observables aren't just random matrices. So the nice thing about this screw of theory is that if you know the spectral function of our original observable, we can directly get the spectral function of the growth operators in a very straightforward way. Namely, what we find is that they are proportional to the spectral function of our original observable times some polynomial. And this polynomial can simply be read off from the growth operators. So if you know how to expand, if we, if we have these growth operators, we can expand them in our time involved operator. We can just basically take the coefficients here and plug them in the polynomials here. Again, this correspondence is not that important. I just want to give you the equations. The crucial thing is that the orthonormality of the growth operators now basically translates to an orthonormality condition on these polynomials that appear in the spectral function of the growth operators. And this allows us to use a lot of the properties that people have studied in these orthonormal polynomials to say something about the growth dynamics and what these are going to converge to, which is to tell us basically what is the large end limit of this hopping problem. And if I do that, I can basically look at my, my chaotic dynamics. I can look at the spectral function. And it's a function of omega. Things are periodic, so this lies between 0 and 2 pi. And I have something that looks like this. Basically, tell me I have non-trivial response at all possible frequencies. This is a spectral function of my original observable. Then I can calculate the spectral function of, say, my second curl operator, which is this orange line here. And it looks something like this. I can do this for, say, the 15th curl operator, and I get a spectral function that looks something like this. And clearly what is going on is that this automatization returns the curl operators, which have an increasing, increasingly flat spectral function, which is telling me that's automatization, starting from local observables that satisfy ETH, gives me a set of operators that look increasingly like random matrices, where we can quantify very precisely, because, again, with, with this connection with orthonormal polynomials, Essentially, what we're doing is systematically killing off the Fourier components of the spectral function. So this is also telling me why these operators are in a sense maximally ergodic, 
because they really just look like random matrices. So we can also just model them using random matrix theory. So this is just what happens in Catholic systems. Also what happens in unitary systems. So there we saw that we just need the first two basis operators. And again, if I look at my first base operator, I have this spectral function, which is the blue line. Then the next Kirov basis operator simply has this flat spectrum again. So you know it here, you can just calculate it. We find that always we get this convergence to just a flat spectral function, which leads to this unidirectional hopping, which leads to observables that have basically a uh, vanishing autocorrelation function and can just be treated as some memoryless states in your operator in Hilbert space. Now, we can also use this to understand why you can get qualitatively different behavior in models that can be mapped to free fermions, depending on a clutter step. So here I take my free model, get this xx plus yy, and I look at what's happening close to this clutter transition, which was at pi over 8. So I plot my spectral function as a function of omega for my original observable, and it looks something like this. And the crucial thing here is that you can tell that there's a gap in the spectral function around omega. And this is really just a property of these non-attracting models, that if you excite them, they're not going to have a response at all possible frequencies. Rather, they're going to be set by some range of quasi-energy excitations. I can, again, calculate the, the spectral function of my higher order Krilov operators. And if I do that, I see that it doesn't really flatten. Or rather, it tries to flatten, but it has very high oscillations on top. And also, all operators the spectral gap that this function has around the pi mode. However, we can exactly calculate the spectral function. And what we find is that this gap actually closes at delta t equals pi over 8, which is exactly our critical cluster step. So on the right-hand side here, I show what's happening for a cluster step that's slightly larger than the critical cluster step. And here I can see that I now have spectral function that's non-zero at all possible frequencies. And if I do this optimization procedure, I calculate my curve operators. I essentially get something that now again converges to a flat spectrum without these massive oscillations. So in that sense, we can completely understand these trotter transitions in free models by basically seeing that, okay, because these are now for chem models, we also need to look at what's happening near the pi mode. And it turns out that these have a gap where you cannot have any excitations near a frequency that's close to pi for a sufficiently small trotter step. The moment your trotter step is large enough, then you can think this gap closes, and you can actually have a flat spectrum. Um, you can also look into what's happening in interacting models here. In the interest, interest of time, I'm just going to skip this. And I'm just going to go to my conclusions. So first thing what I want to do is show that we can define this full framework of critical dynamics for unitary models. This can be either for care or unitary circuits. And we see the same thing that we observed in Hamiltonian dynamics, that we get qualitatively different behavior depending on whether our unitary dynamics is chaotic, integral, and then within integrable, we also need to distinguish basically free models and interacting models. We can relate what's happening in the curve space to the spectral function, which has also been used as diagnostic for quantum chaos in many other setups and has a natural connection to eigenstate normalization. And we can use that as a diagnostic for total transitions. And all of that is more abstract, but I think the really interesting thing to me here that this optimization procedure really identifies the physically relevant part of the operator Hilbert space. Because all dynamics is constrained to the square of space, and we've just shown that we can really just throw out a large part of a curve space, just replace it by a memoryless bath, and dynamics is going to look identical. So in that sense, this is something that's very convenient for numerical algorithms, something we're probing right, sorry, which is something we're studying right now, just really artificially killing off part of your curl space returns essentially the same dynamics up until some exponentially small correction. It's also something that can be very naturally broken in quantum computing setups. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I was hoping that you Hi. could comment on uh, unitarity in the uh, yeah. uh, chaotic um, uh, uh, Form of the of of the like uh, Lanchos basis that you had for the for the unitary circuits. Yeah. What's like behind this question is that like you you extrapolate to have this matrix at, at large n, which is basically just like a, yeah. a right shift in this basis, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and and that uh, like if you if you just like continue that extrapolation forever, 
um, that matrix is not unitary, right? Because it, it has some yes. like some kind of kernel. Um, so no, like I completely agree. So in this sense, so eventually, if you keep doing that, this at some point you're going to exhaust your full Hilbert space, and then you're going to start hopping back. So you essentially have exponential number of just hoppings to the right, and then it's going to come back. So in that sense, this form is like similar to a Jordan form, which is an isometry. So say u times u dagger equals identity, but u dagger times u does equal the identity. So if you have any kind of cutoff, you have an isometry here. But then the moment you really have your full Hilbert space, then you essentially have this additional hopping term that takes you back to the beginning. And then you cover something that's fully unitary. So in principle, I've only shown you this matrix for finite, finite uh, indices. In principle, this sh should become, okay, if you have thermodynamically in the thermodynamic limit, this should be an, become an infinite matrix. And then it's not, no longer an issue. The moment you have some finite model, then again, you're going to have boundary conditions. And then this form is also going to get broken at some point. So, right. So, right. But yeah. it, it, it kind of seems like in, in the infinite system, like you're, you're saying that um, the dynamics is like inherently non unitary, it seems. Right. Like you, yes. If you just like take these boundary conditions off to infinity, like the, the kind of limit matrix that you have is, is non unitary. Uh, like yes, exactly. Statement? Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that's also then, I think, the mo okay, you need to be very careful then with basically translating statements about this infinite Hilbert space to, okay, from operators to matrices. So there might be some issues there with left and right multiplication. So right. I was just wondering whether this cryo of dynamics has some, uh, provides some better resolution to distinguish between pre-thermal dynamics from a uh, slowly uh, slow dynamics of a localized system or this kind of stuff so is there early they can cap capture early signatures for the late stage dynamics but yeah no that's a yeah that's a very good question people have studied this quite a lot in the context of hamiltonian dynamics also basically to look at localization um i would say that there hasn't been that conclusive since the role that he, the fact that you introduce disorder, for example, really needs to make sure that you need to go to a lot, a lot, uh, a much larger curl of space. Um, I don't think this method is best suited to re look at pre thermal dynamics. I know that, for example, Anatoly Polkovnikov has also tried to relate this to localization. This you can again use this to connect to, for example, these fidelity susceptibilities that he's looked into. But I would say, in principle, you can do this, but it's not very natural and it's much. Uh, heavier numerically than just looking at um, yeah translation invariance in Hamiltonians. So just to just a curiosity, uh, so yeah. if, can you apply this formulation to let's say non Hermitian dynamics? Yes, um, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking this question because at yeah. least uh, in that case also you can write things as e to the power i h t, yeah. which is non Hermitian, but then the, the rest of the vector space. Uh, construction and so on, it all goes through? Yeah. So in principle, there's no issue extending any of these two open systems. And various groups are looking into this at the moment. Then the question is, again, to identify the most natural optimization procedure to do. So right now, I was interested in these unitary transformations, because they still preserve this notion of locality. You can show that, OK, as I go to a different, as I go to larger and larger group operators, their support also increases. So if you have a Leovian, there's not a natural candidate to do so. But if you do this, for example, for a non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, this would work perfectly well. So in that sense, you can do this very easily. Um, but I think it just really depends on what kind of dynamics you're looking into. But in that sense, everything generalizes straightforwardly. The only issue is that we had this very nice form of our unitary evolution operator, where we only really, to, really need to know at hopping to the right, hopping to the left, and on-site interactions. And we really need to use, to use unitarity to make sure that we didn't need all of the matrix elements. So naively, if you just take some Leovillian and do this optimalization, if you have some dissipation, then you're going to need to use all of the matrix elements, which is again going to give you something that's exponentially costly. So in that sense, you also lose a lot of these nice interpretations. Uh, what I meant is if you take the Leovillian and you, know, you go yep. to a limit where um, your jump terms are not relevant, so that it yeah. can be described as a non-Hermitian dynamics. Oh, and then yeah. it should be very close to what you are doing. And the question is, is there a twist which one would miss as one tries to do this? Um, 
no, I think actually that would be very interesting. And I feel like everything should go through. I don't think people have done this yet, but it's definitely an interesting uh, thing to look into. I have a related question to the last question. So in one of your slides, you showed that these dynamics can be uh, mapped to some kind of a memoryless birth, right? Yes. Uh, so it is like a, you're talking about like a Markovian birth kind. Yes, exa exactly. So, yeah, I mean, you can also map it to kind of Evillian dynamics or uh, something like uh, with a steady yes. state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think actually that's the main application of this framework that I'm interested in, that this really tells you which kind of dissipation you should engineer to basically optimi optimally use your help over space. So here you can really identify the most relevant operators. You can design some dissipator that essentially kill off everything that lies within above this threshold. And then you should be able to get a much more, and then you get a much more efficient description of your operator dynamics. And for example, if you say here steady state, that's exactly what's going to end up happening because all correlation functions in this Celtic model, so the moment you can introduce this cutoff, are just going to go to zero. Your system is just going to thermalize. So in that sense, you have this Markovian bed, which is going to lead to thermalization um, for basically all of your local observables. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>